or you can either drive cost or efficiency either way. Okay, so let me try to get in two minutes. I'll try to finish off with a few, a few comments. Um, I'm not a football fan. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's an interesting idea when you talk about game changers. How does it happen? And there's a few things here. I mean, football went from, you know, the early days, uh, as they say, just a way to get a bunch of guys on a field to, you know, an, under non-battle conditions to have battle. Uh, and they hurt each other. And so it had a change. Uh, they went from a spherical ball to a, you know, a, 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 you know, an oblique ball so you could pass it. A lot of things happened. It probably, and, and of course, the biggest thing that probably happened to football period is, is that it became a huge money, uh, a money machine. So it changed. It went from a spherical ball to a spheroidical, you know, sort of whatever you call that shape, and then, and then, uh, and then became a multi-billion dollar business. It took a long time for this to happen. Many things happened, partially it being safety in the early days, part of it being even Teddy Roosevelt saying, this is unsafe, change it, all the way down. So there was government intervention. There was, you know, all the way down. It became a huge thing. It took a long time to make change happen. So change takes time. It can't happen overnight. Our expectations now are, are things have to change fast. And many of you may have seen this one. This is uh, from the New York Times that, you know, in the old days, things, even the refrigerator, could take quite a while to really penetrate the market. But of course, as you get closer and closer to present, like the internet has just taken off in a series, short period of year. Even the CCD, which I mentioned, only took about seven, eight, nine years. So our expectations are short, but the issue really is how short can we do it? Uh, a little plug for National Labs, and uh, just say very briefly, you know, how are we going to make this change happen? You know, there's, there's a lot going on. We're all sitting here wondering what to invest in, not only from a, from a, a business point of view, but also from a research point of view. Where are we going to invest? Uh, one of the things that we do at the National Labs is think carefully about this, mostly because we do research in a mission-driven environment. We're different from universities. We're not just pie-in-the-sky greenfield type of research, although we do that. We really do focus on mission-driven research. Uh, and we also focus on building cross-disciplinary teams. So the battery program I showed you is based around that. So we think there's, there's ways to start thinking about mission-driven. The CCD was invented at Bell Labs, right? We were, they were thinking about information technology. It won a Nobel Prize, but it also changed the way we live our lives. So we're starting to think carefully, how do we at a lab like Argonne and like Berkeley Labs and like Oak Ridge National Labs and, and others bring together researchers that recreates what was there at a place like Bell Labs so we're starting to think carefully about how to create a model that better brings together or tries to accelerate from you know, 20 years to five years, if it's possible. Now, everybody in this audience has probably thought about how do I accelerate innovation. In my mind, the best way to do that is to get together the main players right at the beginning, early on. The battery story went from researchers you know, that one day realized the battery industry could use it and went out and said, well, what about this? And they said, great. So what we've started to do is put together teams, substantial teams, this is an example in the battery space, but we're doing it in a couple spaces that include lab national laboratories like Argonne and, and Pacific Northwest and Berkeley, universities that are great innovators and great independent individual thinkers, and some companies that will tell us we can't manufacture that. A123 or Johnson Controls, by the way, is the biggest battery manufacturer, mostly lead acid, but the biggest battery manufacturer in the world. They're in the room when we start talking about the R&D we want to do. So this is, I think, a very important way to do this kind of work to make sure that the researchers do research in a mission-driven environment. They're not just doing it because they love doing it. They still love doing it, and they still have a lot of latitude. But the choices they make when they come to a fork in the road may be different depending on whether JCI is in the room with an engineer or not. So we think this is the way to go. Uh, let me just see if I can finish off here quickly. Uh, so you know, the, the upshot is, of course, coming from a research institution, is, is that discovery and invention power the US economy, from the CCD to the laser, 50% of the GDP today is given to technology. And the question is, is energy the right thing? Is energy the, the next driver? And I think clearly yes. Uh, President Obama said uh, just a few months ago uh, that you know, we have to go from importing 11 million barrels of oil a day uh, to a th cut that by a third. So if we electrify the vehicle fleet, I told you we could save 7.2 million barrels a day. So we can get there. But we just have to ask how we're going to get there. And I think we have to do it in ways that are, that are, that are very focused. So this is a very high-level statement, but it will require long-term support to boost competitiveness. And by support, it's at all levels, and it's not just government. The other day, on Saturday, I went to a, uh, a bill signing with Governor Quinn, my governor, and, and thankfully we have an honest governor, I think, for, for once. Uh, I went to a bill signing with him. It was a tiny little bill. He was signing a bill to make uh, loans available to companies that do share, like, like, uh, like um, Go, what is it called, iCar, uh, iGo. So it's a, it's a company that, that has car shares, both non-electric and electric. It was a bill he was signing to make a competitive grant for 
companies that are buying electric vehicles to start doing these kinds of you know, car shares with electric vehicles, small, but it was support, and it was a very important piece of support. That kind of thing has to happen to drive, the procure, the, the, to drive it on, the, on the, the purchase side. But we also need real investment on the R&D side. Today, we're underinvested in energy compared to any other nation, I think, that is, is like China and like the EU. Uh, it's really uncertain now. So if you ask me to tell you what the policies ought to be, I, I'd be at a loss for words. We have this mantra all the time, the age of cheap oil is over. I, it's, we've said that over and over again. In the 70s we said it and it went down to a dollar a gallon. Now we're saying it because it seems like, even though there's a lot of volatility in the supply, that the price of gas isn't changing a lot. We've sort of been stuck around $4 a gallon. But again, is that right? Is it not right? We don't know. It's uncertain. Natural gas, clearly a huge discovery of natural gas. The ability to get it, not just in this country, in uh, everywhere around the world, natural gas is clearly going to be a huge growth business. Can we use it, even for automobiles? Can we, you know, can we reform uh, natural gas, make liquid gas? And there are a lot of questions. Methane is good stuff. It is lower carbon footprint, but it's not necessarily lower greenhouse gas, right? Because at the wellhead, you're emitting a lot of methane. Methane is 10,000 times worse than carbon. So there's a lot of questions. It's uncertain. And China clearly will lead this. I mean, we're already, we're already lagging in investment. The R&D dollars are way behind. Industrial investment's way behind. China clearly will lead this. The question is, how do we make sure we're partnered with China in the right way, not to give away all of our intellectual property, but at the same time to partner with them? Because, by the way, they're going to produce. They're already producing more solar than we're producing. They're already producing a lot more wind than we're producing. And they will be building a lot more coal plants than we're building. So, on every, from every point of view, what we do here affects them, what they do there affects us. So this is sort of a generic statement, but we must stay competitive in renewables for both security and economic reasons. Uh, and, and to finish off, this is just a picture. This is my last slide. Uh, you know, I, I say it's a challenge, but we are doing it. This is a, this is a, a battery manufacturing plant. This is a, a, a plant, that, it's actually LG Chem, but this was in Wired Magazine a few months ago. Uh, this is a GM got some recovery money to build a plant with, well, it's LG Chem who got the recovery money to build a plant, uh, and they're starting to make batteries in this country, right? There's, a, there's now something like at least a half a dozen new companies in this country building batteries due to recovery money, but there's more than 40 or 50 of those battery companies, including little ones like A123 or medium size like A123, and big ones like Johnson Controls who are making stuff here again. So the real issue here is how do we make sure this happens, the jobs are created, and the technology gets, gets ultimately transferred into the into the um, marketplace. So with that, I'll end. A few minutes late, I apologize. <laughs> I blew through it. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm willing to take questions uh, now or later. I do have a question.